This work started uh, as part of a project with uh, Ali Hortatsu, who's uh, my colleague in the economics department. And, uh, we were interested in, you know, to put it broadly, the structure of firms. So what sort of industries do firms choose to operate in? And, uh, you know, what markets do they choose to be part of and not be part of? And uh, in particular, uh, this paper uh, was uh, looking at uh, vertical integration decisions, where vertical uh, integration implies the make versus buy decision. So is a company going to uh, buy its inputs from other producers on a market, or is it going to choose to uh, make, their own, uh, make its own inputs and, uh, and source itself? Uh, that way. So a recent example of important reasons for choosing to become vertically integrated would be Boeing and the production of the 787. So Boeing had chosen early in the stages of the uh, project to outsource an unprecedented uh, number of the components of the, the airplane. And it turned out they had a number of uh, problems in production um, the suppliers were behind, there were quality issues, and so they decided to take over production of many of those components themselves. That decision to uh, create the ability to make those inputs themselves, i.e. within Boeing, rather than rely on uh, arm's length transactions with suppliers to do it, what is vertical integration. Once Boeing acquired the ability to produce those inputs, they became vertically integrated in those inputs. What we were going after here with this project is to try to understand when companies do decide to uh, be vertically integrated, why are they doing that? Why are they choosing to make their own or to, why are they choosing to make inputs that they would use themselves uh, and to have a, a vertical structure? And if they choose to do that, do they look different than other firms uh, that choose not to on other dimensions? It was really about you know, trying to understand uh, how companies that choose to be able to source their own inputs might be uh, systematically different than those that do not. So we wanted to learn more about why uh, companies chose to be vertically integrated. And we realized there have been you know, many case studies in the in the academic literature where you'd pick a specific industry and try to understand the reasons for vertical integration and, and uh, you know, tie that to the theories on why companies might, be, might choose to be integrated. But there wasn't anything systematic. And uh, that's when Ali and I recognized that there was this data at the Census Bureau that had been collected over a few decades but really hadn't been uh, leveraged to answer this question. Um, and uh, that's, that's how we, you know, we realized we could answer the set of questions that a lot of people have and be able to answer some of these, uh, address some of these issues in a systematic way using this, this data. They collect records of companies' shipments, where they're sending all sorts of goods. So every truck that goes out, it's got some uh, products on it. How much is it worth? How heavy was it? Which direction is it going? Is it going by... You know, is it going by truck or is it going to go by other modes of transportation? So just to make, give you a concrete example, a hypothetical, not one specific from the data, but we would see a firm that uh, we knew made washing machines, for example. And we also knew that they had a factory that made electric motors. Now, electric motors are used to make washing machines. But then when we would look and ask where did that company's electric motors go, the old story was, well, they're making electrical motors, they make washing machines, they're going to send the motors and put them in the washing machines. Turns out that's not the typical case. Uh, over half of the, uh, well, about a third of the uh, plants that we looked at, the motor type plants, weren't sending any of their inputs uh, within the firm. They were going completely uh, outside the firm. And even those that did send uh, inputs inside the firm s tend to send a very small fraction. You know, so that the uh, typical um, amount of inputs that would be stay within the firm was about five percent. So the typical story about vertical integration is the River Rouge story, where coal comes in one end of the factory and 
cars go out the other, and everything uh, about making those cars goes on inside the firm. Well, it turns out that's not the case. We did find a very small fraction of uh, producers, about 2%, that fit that story very well. Now, you might say, well, maybe that's because they just make far more inputs uh, than they could possibly use. Well, for one, that begs the question, well, why don't they have more capability to use those inputs they're making? But it turns out that that's not important either. E even if you just look and say, well, they're making so many millions of dollars of washing machines, how many electrical motors would they need? Well, uh, even if you look at their production as a fraction of, of or, uh, how many of their electrical motors stay inside the firm as a fraction of what they could possibly use, it's still a tiny fraction. Everyone seems to be uh, producing for each other even though they have this vertical structure where they own the ability to make their own inputs. We think we have an answer, but we have to admit we can't know for sure given our ability to measure the things we measure. But, but here's what the story is. Um, in some sense, it's a twist on the traditional vertical integration, the, reason, the ex traditional explanation for why firms are vertically integrated. But it's a twist in an interesting direction. So the usual explanation is you, know, you have problems buying your inputs on the market because things are hard to contract over or there's pricing issues that you can't work out in an arm's length trans transaction so you take that over yourself. Well we think that's still going on but we think the focus of those conversations is has been in the wrong place. So those conversations have tend to fo tended to focus on the actual input itself. So going back to the washing machine and electrical motor story it's tended to focus on, okay, what is it about electrical motors that could get messed up when you try to write contracts about supply of electrical motors. We instead say, no, it's probably not about the physical goods. Instead, it's about other inputs that are transferred along the production chain besides the physical good itself. Things like managerial ability, uh, sales and marketing know-how, research and development, knowledge stocks, intangible inputs that are very important and used along different levels of the production chain uh, within and across firms. Perhaps it's not surprising that those intangible inputs might be the reason for vertical integration rather than the physical good itself. Because if you think about it, you know, physical goods are something you can see them, you can, you can verify whether some specifications were held to or not by a supplier. So if you've got some contractual problem that you have to work out in court, that could be, tend to be easy. But it's much harder to do that sort of thing for uh, managerial uh, inputs or sales and marketing know-how or research and development knowledge stocks. It's hard to verify and measure in the first place for that matter the quantity, the quality uh, of the extent of the flow of those goods and those types of intangibles up and down the production chain. So if firms are going to have difficulty transacting in the movement of those intangible inputs, then they might tend to be vertically integrated for that reason, rather than moderating the flow of these tangible goods like the motors into uh, the washing machines examples. So there, there, there are really two questions or two issues that this intangible story raises. The first is that this whole no notion of directionality in a vertical production chain where you start with raw materials and then move down through intermediate materials and then finally end up with a, uh, a final good that's sold to consumers or to other firms the intangibles don't need to flow in the same direction as the physical goods do. Managerial inputs can just as easily move from a firm's downstream operations to a firm's upstream op operations. So that's the, the first implication. The second implication is that vertical itself really isn't a distinct category of firm of, uh, expansion. So if you think about the traditional story for why a firm might expand horizontally. So horizontally means into either uh, into related markets uh, that are somehow distinct product markets. So it could be a different product or the same product in a new geographic market. 
So the typical story economists have for horizontal integration is the firm has some expertise in a particular market and it figures, well, that expertise could apply over here in this related market as well. So they expand into that related market and try to apply the expertise, which is, of course, tied to these intangible inputs in these new markets. Well, that same story can work vertically as well. Obviously, the industry that supplies to you and the industry that buys from you are related businesses to what you're doing. And it's not perhaps shocking that a company that, that thinks it knows what it's doing in its own operations might also figure it could handle what its supplier is doing or what its buyer is doing as well because they're clearly related businesses and in some industries they're highly related businesses. So a firm may, or may expand vertically to expand, again, its expertise over related areas, but it's not the traditional story expanding vertically to solve some problem with the physical input production. Uh, rather, it's to transfer these intangible inputs over a larger set of uh, lines of business that are related to what it does now. So in that way, vertical integration isn't any different than horizontal integration. It's really the same story. Uh, it's just been thought about as being a distinct story because of the tie to this production chain uh, notion. The general takeaway lesson for practitioners from, uh, from our work, I think, is just to, again, when thinking about the vertical integration decision, shift the focus from the, in, the tangible inputs to the intangible inputs, because that seems to be driving uh, most of the vertical structure decisions we see in the economy. It's really these intangibles uh, that are shaping the way firms uh, operate.